Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the correct views. Sam I.B. DeGangie doing commentary for the Media Speaks. If I was staring blankly into the camera, it's a long time viewers will know it's not always easy to sync two cameras, low def and high def rock my board. Um, if I look fuzzy and uh, unshaven, that's because, oddly enough, I'm fuzzy and unshaven. We went to see uh, Judas Priest and uh, got to meet them in Saxon, and it was very, very cool. I will be covering all of that on the Media Speaks entertainment section when we uh, do the end. It's uh, 2 o'clock, 2 p.m. on Saturday, mediaspeaks.com. Find them on Facebook. Um, I'll be doing the entire uh, review of the concert. Uh, for those of you that would like to see uh, Saxon, um, I have interviews with them online. I, and uh, my Sam DeGangie page has a lot of the entertainment stuff up. So just a heads up, uh, I will be doing a full entertainment update at the Media Speaks on Saturday. Regarding the Judas Priest concert, also friends, I know all of you are here for the, the, the meat and the potatoes, and trust me, you're going to wish we were talking about entertainment and things a little more lighthearted once we get into the news we've got today, unfortunately. This is uh, Emily Foster, Our Future. How banks did more damage to Baltimore than rioters. Now, before you zone out, the point that's made in this article is irrefutable fact. So listen to it, share it. Uh, once you have the knowledge, uh, definitely pass the knowledge on to others. The death of Freddie Gray in Baltimore is not just a story of police brutality or the lack of socioeconomic mobility for the urban poor. It's also a story of how deregulation allowed corporate banks to strip middle class families of their financial stability and walk away, leaving behind payday lenders and check cashing stores to plunder low income and minority commu uh, communities. <clears throat> Let me mention something here. When uh, they're talking about deregulation here, for those of you that don't know, that, <clears throat> that opened the door for a lot of corruption that led to the downfall of uh, the middle class lifestyle and uh, with it the opportunity for uh, people in lower income brackets to come up. It made us uh, much more of a feudal system in terms of the, uh, the way the country is run. And uh, again, look at the, uh, the amount of money that is paid in interest to these uh, loan sharking payday advance people and I, I understand that they're uh, <clears throat> they're taking risks by loaning the money, but what they're doing, <coughs> excuse me, is licensed loan sharking. It says to better understand and communicate that story. So then Elizabeth Warren, a ranking member of the subcommittee on economic policy, and uh, Representative Elijah E. Cummings, Maryland, a ranking member of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, took the Middle Class Pro Prosperity Project to Baltimore on Monday. It was the latest in a series of forums that started in February to focus congressional and public attention on challenges faced by the middle class. Says so Baltimore was hit especially hard in the 2008 economic collapse, which was caused by what? It was caused by bankers ripping off people who were buying houses they would give you the house with what was called an arm, an adjustable rate mortgage, and you were able to make your payments at, at a rate, but at, at you know, say, they, the, original, uh, the original rate, 15%, whatever. But then they would jump it up to, say, 28%. And, of course, you couldn't pay it, so they took your house. Um, I, I can tell you from firsthand experience that student loans do this. Um, I went through a divorce and had... Uh, payments due. It wasn't really, I was moving, I was in the process of moving, they defaulted me and uh, have completely cheated me out of the rate that I was promised to when I had gone. So I'll be paying on that for the rest of my life because of these sorts of things. And this is the kind of, uh, kind of insanity that has led to the economic collapse that we did see in 08. It says in 2008, 3,909 foreclosures were filed in the city of Baltimore. In 2009, the number increased to 6,213, an almost 60% increase. The city's median property value, value dropped by $10,500 between 07 and 12. 
As of 2014, the city is ranked 69th out of 100 by Brookings on the strengths of economic recovery. And again, this is what happens when you uh, allow your jobs to be outsourced and you allow banks to move in and do some of the things that we talk about on the show on a regular basis. We've touched on them today. It says even while Baltimore and other cities struggled, the federal government held corporations in higher regard than the American people. $1.2 trillion in post-recession bailouts from the Federal Reserve to private banks was equal to the money lost by homeowners holding 6.5 million foreclosed mortgages. In other words, all the money the banks needed to get themselves out of the mess that they put themselves in through their greed and no help for the people that got trampled by the banks in their greed. It says these bailouts were a result of the federal government's prior decisions to appease corporate interests. Warren at the panel of the University of Maryland Carey School of Law in Baltimore emphasized the role of deregulation and how it contributed to the foreclosure crisis. None of this had to happen, and I don't really agree with this woman very much, but I do here. It says it's because of policy decisions made at the federal and state level, policy decisions to deregulate financial institutions, to turn them loose and to allow them to do whatever they wanted to do to make profits. <coughs> this is exactly what they did. Uh, you want more of an explanation? Well, you'll get one. It says the deregulation and minimal government oversight that followed the bank's discriminatory and unfair actions during the foreclosure crisis are responsible for many of the city's hardships today. On January 8th of 08, for instance, former Baltimore Mayor Sheila Dixon's administration filed a suit against Wells Fargo in the U.S. District Court. That's another big bank, another crooked bank that we've covered here a lot. It says the city claimed that Wells Fargo charged higher fees to black borrowers through their subprime lending program designed for less credit worthy customers who are more likely to default on loans. The city claimed that the bank's discriminatory and predatory lending practices led to foreclosures, reduced city tax revenues, and increased the city's costs due to crimes surrounding the abandoned properties. The city asked for the bank to cover the costs associated with these damages. Uh, they loan money to people that they knew couldn't pay it back, or at least at rates they knew that many would foreclose on. But enough would keep making payments that they were able, they, were, they thought they were going to be able to get themselves out of it. And of course they did, on your tax dollar. Uh, many of the people who pay taxes had their tax dollars go to bail the banks out when they were losing their house after they were ripped off by the banks. It says in 2010, the bank won the dismissal of the lawsuit <coughs> brought by Baltimore. Yeah, the banks always win. How, how, how's that always happen? It says in 2012, the U.S. Department of Justice sued Wells Fargo for failing to report more than 6,000 loans that did not meet insurance requirements under the Federal Housing Administration and for its failure to properly review any early payment defaults. The bank settled paying $17.5 million to the city of Baltimore and $2.5 million to 1,000 area residents who were affected. It says, Matria Wilson, Vice President of Governmental Affairs and Senior Counsel at the City for Responsible Lending, explained that the corporate funding of congressional campaigns is to blame for the lack of legislation. In other words, uh, it says, commercial banks contributed $55 million to Republican campaigns during 2004 to 2008. As of 2014, 17 of the 20 recipients' commercial banks' funds were Republicans. And of course, so what they do, they, the Republicans voted in mass to bail these banks out with, uh, with almost no thought for the people that they had hosed over by what they did. And the people that are now being hosed over in much the same way now. Um, from the way that America's getting hosed to the way that uh, a lunatic wants us to be hosed, uh, we're going to move on here. This is from the independent.co.uk. North Korea threatens nuclear attack on the U.S. This is a country so strange that even China distances itself from them and is only supportive of them because of their love for communism. The truth be known, I don't think the leaders of China like Kim Jong-un or his family any more than they like Obama. I, I really don't see it happening. Um... And you can see why. This, this man here, if you've, ever, if you've never seen 
a North Korean documentary, then we need to pause for a second here. This is a place that has miles upon miles of every city that doesn't even have greenery, have no trees, because the people are starving so badly that they eat the grass as if they were grazing. That's all that they have. Um, if they put you in prison for speaking out against the regime, you and three generations of your family will go to a prison. They have considered themselves an enemy of America for the last 50 years, when for all intents and purposes, America really hasn't provoked North Korea, at least not in a way, I mean, they were hating us during the Reagan years, and Reagan did nothing to provoke. Korea. There have always been sanctions on them, largely because they kill and slaughter in mass. They are um, they are people who live richly. I mean, ultra rich, lavish lifestyles. While their people starve. Look up Korean and North Korean documentaries. Look up how they what they do to their prisoners. They were kneel and make them kneel on boards with nails in it, and uh, while they're being raped. Um, they have set people on fire. They have starved them to death. This is the kind of people we're talking about. And there they run a country that has a nuclear weapon. North Korea has threatened to attack the U.S. with nuclear weapons if the country forces it to do so. And, of course, that would be the very last thing North Korea did. The trouble is, uh, wiping out North Korea with a nuclear weapon isn't really an option that we have, of course, because of what that would do to the Orient, especially our uh, ally, South Korea. It says, Park Young Chol, the deputy director of the North Korean think tank, the Institute for Research into National Reunification, gave a rare two-hour interview with CNN on Thursday. It said the network said it only allowed to conduct the interview on the basis that the two portraits leaders of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il were visible behind Park during the filming. You do realize that the leader is Kim Il-sung is dead, and he is known as the eternal leader. And he is still officially the leader of North Korea. And he's dead. His grandson has taken a bad country and made it worse. And uh, taken greed to a whole new level. Uh, paying off politicians and what's called gift politics. You name it, they do it. It says, in it, he escalated Pyongyang's, that's the capital, a fiery rhetoric by claiming North Korea was nuclear capable and equipped with long-range missiles that he warned could reach the U.S. mainland. It says, we are equipped with nuclear arsenals, Park reiterated. We may use them if we are forced to, by the U.S. to do so. <clears throat> North Korea has repeatedly threatened nuclear attacks and promised it was ready any time to launch nuclear missiles at the U.S. as recently as March. And they're angry at us because, they, because we sanctioned them. Well, let me tell you something. They say that they need no outside intervention of any kind. That they, in fact, are a closed unit. So if they're a closed unit, why would our sanctions hurt them? They, they've got everything handled, right? They, everything's under control. They don't need the U.S., so I don't see what the problem is. I don't see why they hate us. Point is, they can't do anything. Because it's not just communism, which already, we already know is a death knell to a society. This is a weird kingdom meets fascism kind of communism. It's, it's pretty twisted. It says, Park also outright denied the existence of brutal police camps, detailed in a shocking report by Human Rights by the United Nations, claiming that North Korea society, listen to this, their society has no political strife, factions, or political division, and therefore no need for the term political prisoner. <laughs> First of all, this is the kind of thing that they, uh, that, that, do you remember Adolf Hitler bragging that he didn't just get rid of communists, he got rid of all political dissenters and brought unity to Germany? No, he didn't. He just butchered everybody that didn't agree with him. And that's exactly the wording that they're using here. It's happening in North Korea. Uh, the trouble is that uh, it, it, Kim Jong-un is not the great speaker that uh, some people in his family have been. It's, uh, this man poisoned his aunt and killed his uncle, to give you some insight, okay? North Korean defectors have given harrowing accounts of being beaten, tortured, and experiencing other human rights abuses while being 
detained in prison camps. And you can tell this in the way that uh, <clears throat> they catch child molester scum. They tend to have a certain way that they do things. And this way permeates their actions in such a way that they can tell that the stories are true. You get four or five people corroborating one story or saying that something was said to them in a certain way when they've never met each other. In other words, we can document that these prison camps are real and the torture and abuse that is in them is only too real. It says, if you talk about human rights in my country, I will talk about human rights in the U.S., he added. You have racial riots taking place in the wake of the killing of so many black people by police. That's not true at all. What That's very short-sighted. Uh, what we actually have here is a lot of people in violent neighborhoods being stirred up for the wrong causes instead of unifying for the correct ones. Can I get an amen? It says, you have prisons full of inmates and new techniques of torture are being used. Uh, perhaps so, but not in the way that uh, North Korea is by any stretch of the imagination. But that, that goes to show you how truly out of touch they are to try to make that analogy. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying the U.S. is flawless, but this is the pearly gates compared to North Korea. It says, the U.S. president and other high-ranking administration officials have acknowledged really severe forms of punishment on inmates in detention. Yeah, I would imagine so, like kneeling on a board while being raped, for instance. Friends, this is from Breitbart.com. Uh, some Rand Paul news, I, I think he was right about this. It says, uh, we're a lot worse off with Saddam Hussein out of the picture. This is true. Not as true as in Libya. Uh, Libya had a very functional country, and uh, a fuzzy head, as they called him, Gaddafi, with all of his faults, and he had faults. He was very good, and I've said this prior, of keeping the Christians and the Sunnis and the Shiites and the secularists apart but peaceful. Well, of course, thanks to Hillary Clinton, now that's become a distant memory. Well, Saddam Hussein was not the leader that Gaddafi was. Uh, Saddam Hussein was a butcher, and he did, did, did house uh, members of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Musab al-Zarqari was given safe haven in Iraq so don't tell me that there wasn't ISIS, or excuse me, Al-Qaeda in Iraq before we invaded, because there was. Um, again, and that doesn't mean that taking him out was going to be a good idea, because it would open up a hole for someone worse, or a situation that was worse, or more butcherous, if you will. Is that a word? Butcherous. I don't think so. It is now. Um, that's what we're seeing here. Listen to this. Republican presidential candidate <clears throat> and Kentucky Senator Rand Paul argued that we're a lot worse off with Saddam Hussein gone in Iraq and cited George H.W. Bush to criticize Jeb Bush's position on the war uh, with uh, Wolf on CNN. Rand said, I think it's really an <clears throat> important question and I don't think it's just hypothetical. Because we seem to have a reoccurring question in the Middle East whether or not it's a good idea to topple secular strongmen or secular dictators, and what happens after that. Again, it's the what happens after that <clears throat> that has been a reoccurring problem here. It says, you know, Hillary Clinton's war in Libya was the same kind of scenario. We toppered Gaddafi, a secular dictator, but we got chaos in the rise of Islam, and I think we're more threatened now. In other words, Gaddafi <clears throat> wasn't this strict Islamist. What they did is open the door for people who are butchers and haters in the true sense of the word, not the hood sense. Uh, wielding machetes and uh, setting people on fire like savages. This, this was not who Gaddafi was. But it's who we've opened the door to, to take over the country since we've gotten rid of him. It says, I think the same is true of Saddam Hussein. I think Iran is now stronger and emboldened. In many ways, Iraq is sort of a vessel state to Iran. We worry about Iran getting a nuclear weapon, so I think we're a lot worse off with Hussein gone. There's a civil war going on there. Yeah, well, do you remember what Persia was? Persia was one of the most butcherous regimes, there's that word again, that have ever existed. Well, what did their butchery bring? It brought death and pain and destruction. And it was what? It was Iran and Iraq as one country. That was Persia. Now, thanks to George W. Bush, guess what we have? Persia. Michael Savage has mentioned this before, and he's right. 
look it up. It's, it's not a matter of opinion, it's fact. He recreated Persia. Says he continued, we're also making the mistake, I think, to try and degrade Assad at Syria. Because we degraded the strong man Assad, and guess what? ISIS grew. Assad is an evil man, ISIS is more evil. What we did was weaken Assad, and we strengthened ISIS. Says, I think there's a consistent theme here that every candidate should be asked that is, is it a good idea to go into the Middle East, top or governments, and hope that something better arises out of the chaos? Because recent history seems to show that, you know what? We're not getting something better, we're getting something worse. Paul was then asked what he would do given the intelligence assessments about Iraq's WMD program. This is back <clears throat> at the time that it was being debated, and he said, the thing is, we could only say the same for Assad until two years ago. He had stockpiles of chemical weapons. The question is their ability to use the weapons, their proclivity to use the weapons, and what comes after. He added that the first George, the first George Bush, you know, Jeb Bush's dad, thought it would probably be a mistake. Dick Cheney thought it would be a mistake. Did you know that? He did. Ultimately, or originally, to topple Hussein, that chaos would ensure afterwards and sure enough, that still did happen after Hussein was gone. I think even at the time, invading Iraq was a mistake. <clears throat> and I thought that the war, even at that time, was a mistake given the intelligence. But now I think that people should learn their lesson after the war with Libya. Again, Libya is the, the country that we decimated in the name of helping them. Um, I want to get to this. This is Paul Joseph Watson, PJ Dubs here, NSA whistleblower. Mass surveillance threatens free market capitalism. Do you realize that this constant spying that we're seeing is destroying the very fabric of the country while claiming to keep us safe? Because it is. It says NSA whistleblower William Binney warns in a new exclusive InfoWars interview, the capitalism itself is under threat as a result of the fear and stagnation that is being generated by mass government surveillance. And this, I think, can't be, can't be overstressed. It says, Binney, who is a legendary NSA mathematician, developed, <clears throat> much to his chagrin now, the revolutionary logic and architecture that is now used to spy on everybody in the world. So this is someone that knows what he's talking about. He made the program that made it happen. When the NSA decided to use the program on U.S. citizens, he became one of the biggest whistleblowers in the history of the federal agency. During the interview, Binney emphasized one of the most important but often overlooked consequences of mass snooping, and that the mere fear of potentially being under surveillance alters the behavior of the population. What does that do? It restricts expression and free market innovation. In other words, it, it hurts the growth of the country, is what they're saying. It hurts the, 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 the very fabric of the country. Its progress is brought to a halt over this. It says the effect that people are being surveilled inhibits their ability <clears throat> or a feeling that they have the opportunity to do new and creative and innovative things. So that kind of reduces their risk taking, which in turn means you get less and less creativity and innovation and more and more stagnation of civilization, said Benny. <clears throat> and that's what happened in the Soviet Union. That's what happened in East Germany and the communist bloc. They stagnated because people were being so surveilled it made people afraid to take a risk. And that's really the point of capitalism, and that's why it's been so successful, because it was advocating people taking risks, said Benny, <clears throat> noting that if people were not active participants in society, then a totalitarian form of government would inevitably arise. And you saw this when Rome took over the building and uh, construction of everything. You saw it in, uh, that's, that's how Germany was built in World War II. It says, what you think is totally irrelevant, warned Benny, pointing out that the government will decide what constitutes suspicious activity when it comes to a person being under blanket surveillance. It says, um, they had a whole host of contractors that wanted to feed all of that money and all you took the program we did and deployed it, it would really solve the problem, said Benny. You can't go to Congress asking for money for a problem you've already solved, so they have to kill the solution to have a problem. In other words, the excuses that they are using to spy on us nonstop are literally destroying the forward progress of the country. And that's why the Fourth Amendment matters. Also, what matters, we've got three stories left here, it matters that you check out Sticker Junkie. Yes, indeed, not just a segue, but an opportunity to really, really move in 
and uh, get some awesome stickers. I designed these for the band Passing Time, uh, youtube.com slash Sam from Passing Time. You can get these stickers. You get them for a dollar a piece. You can get a CD, you get a free sticker. Just go to youtube.com or uh, leave a comment on this video, whatever. When you go to StickerJunkie.com, do make sure you let David Lake know that you heard about Sticker Junkie from the correct views because you're going to get an amazing discount when you do that. Next story here is brought to you by the uh, wonderful people at Change Taxi. If you live within like a 50 mile radius of Canton, Ohio, and you're going to call a cab or some form of transportation, even Uber, <clears throat> do yourself a favor and get the price off Uber for instance, but then call Change Transportation and let them know what that price was. The price match it for you. Train Change Transportation. All right, friends, this is uh, the Libertarian Party. Governor signs bill making ballot access more difficult for Libertarians. First of all, this should be illegal because how is it that we live in a society where it's legal for the ruling party to make it harder for other parties to ever beat them? <clears throat> Again, that goes back to how fascist nations are constructed, not democratic uh, ones. Also, if anybody again ever votes for Doug Ducey, D-U-C-E-Y, you are an enemy of liberty. How did you find my show and let me awaken you, please? It says, Arizona governor who you should never vote for, Doug Ducey, today signed Bill HB 2608, which makes it much harder for libertarian candidates to get onto the primary ballot. So again, this is why you're finding <clears throat> more and more the uh, libertarian movement, and I'm not real happy about this, trying to infiltrate the Republican Party, where a lot of it is because of the way that they stack the, uh, the deck against the other parties in this country. It says all party candidates must participate in primary elections in Arizona. But before today, a candidate only needed signatures equal to one half of one percent of the party's registered voters in the district of the office for the office in which they were running. One, one, one half of one percent of the people that are registered to your party. Now all statewide candidates must collect signatures equal to one fourth of one percent of the party's registered voters and registered independents. Non-statewide candidates must collect one half of one percent of the party's registered voters plus registered independents. Since independents represent almost 36 percent of the registered votes in the state, voters in the state, excuse me, the amount of signatures necessary to get on the ballot will rise dramatically. For example, before the new law was signed today, a 2016 statewide candidate would have needed 139 signatures to get on the primary ballot. Now, such a candidate needs 2,987 signatures. Thanks to Richard Wigner for pointing this out. So, friends, <clears throat> this is how a country gets stolen from you. For one thing, if you're not allowed to call yourself a libertarian or a green or a unionist or whatever your party is, then if you're labeled <clears throat> as independent, shouldn't that count as libertarian? Another question, maybe libertarians should run as independents. Would that be another way to get around this? The point is, if you vote for Doug Ducey, you are voting for somebody that wants to limit who you are allowed to hear from and who you are allowed to vote for. In other words, friends, he's part of the damn problem, not part of the solution. Two more stories to get to. This is Max Slavo, uh, SHTFplan.com. This is a real commercial from AARP. <clears throat> Riots nationwide have prompted the government to declare martial law. This is creepy. What this is, is it's a commercial. And in the commercial, which is promoting AARP, which is a, 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 a uh, oh, how do I want to put this? It, it, it's an organization for retired adults. It has nothing to do with martial law. In other words, it could be playing uh, music in this in the background of this commercial. It could be playing sports. It's whatever TV droning they have. Well, what they use is a call to martial law that just happens to be on the radio. Listen to this. The bizarre world of militarization and propaganda just got a little bit more crazy and spooky. A new AARP commercial seems to offer a public service announcement, but if you pay close attention to the commercial, you'll hear something very odd in the background. As the woman in the video watches the news, she is called over to another room by her daughter, 
in the background. You may have to turn your audio up a little bit. It says you can clearly hear a news report about riots nationwide and a declaration of martial law by government emergency services. And here's what it says. Riots nationwide have prompted local governments to declare martial law. The president is asking that citizens find safety and remain calm. Authorities are working to contain the outbreak. It says, um, let me, let me play this for you. I'm going to move the mic over so that you guys can actually hear this. You guys on low def uh, might not be able to hear this as well, but uh, this is worth it. This is really the kind of stuff nightmares are made out of. Listen to this. It's coming. That talking in the background that you probably couldn't hear. That talking in the background is them normalizing you to martial law. Why, why would that be playing in an a a AARP commercial? It says, PJ Dove asks the obvious question, given public concerns over Jade Helm Exercise 15 coming this summer, and reports that the government will be simulating martial law and dissonant roundups. Are you getting it? What they're saying is that they are acclimating you to a coming state of martial law. They are getting you used to the fact that you're going to have a standing army in the country, which is supposed to be illegal. They are getting you used to mass takeover. They're embedding it in commercials at this point. It says, the obvious question is, why is this subliminal message about martial law being declared by the president after an outbreak appearing in a public service announcement for caregiving put out by an insurance company? It has no place whatsoever within the context of the ad. Think about this. This had to be specifically created by the company to appear in this public service announcement. They couldn't use an actual segment from a TV news broadcast because they would be concerned about copyright issues. And because no such broadcast exists about the president declaring martial law in America after an outbreak. This was deliberately put in. And it's not going to be heard consciously, but it may be picked up subliminally by the viewer. I mean, what the hell is going on here? This is bizarre. Friends, that'd be like me saying, all right, guys, you're listening to the correct views, got these cool stickers from Sticker Junkie, and then in the background you hear, make sure you worship God because Sam's a Christian and thinks you should be too. And it just plays over and over again, but real faint in the back while I'm doing my Sticker Junkie commercial. Don't you think that'd be a little bit creepy? Well, that is what they did here. Are you getting it now? It says, what's more, the ad was approved and disseminated by the Ad Council, an organization that essentially now serves as a direct propaganda arm of the White House. Look up who Joseph Goebbels was, J-G-O-E-B-E-L-S. Look up what he did. Look up how he used this kind of propaganda to take over a country. Joseph Goebbels. In America, Joseph Goebbels. It says, unless, of course, you consider the American people are being psychologically prepared in advance of exactly such an event. Officials within the U.S. government clearly know something is come, big is coming, and they have been simulating collapse scenarios for many years, and the American people remain oblivious. Well, friends, I'm doing my part here on the correct views. And that brings us to the ever-loving dumdy of the day. Now, Christelle is supposed to be looking at the, uh, to listening for any errors in the broadcast, and I bet she's not. So if you find any errors in the broadcast, make sure you leave a message and let her know, because I, I bet she's not listening. All right, friends, Adam Salazar, PrisonPlanet.com. House Bill seeks to eliminate online ammo sales is the dumdy of the day. All right, let, let's play a little game here. When they made alcohol illegal in Prohibition, everybody quit drinking, right? Weed's illegal. Nobody smokes weed, right? Coke is illegal. Nobody, nobody uses cocaine because it's illegal. What it has done is created a gang warfare on our streets. This is going to put the average drug dealer now into the ammo business. Prohibitions do not work, and that's why this is the dumb deal of the day. Um, a proposed House bill introduced by a freshman Democrat would eliminate the ability for consumers to purchase ammo over the Internet. 
Introduced Tuesday by New Jersey rep Bonnie Watson Coleman. Don't ever vote for Bonnie Watson Coleman. It's like uh, Governor Ducey. Don't ever vote for Ducey. You're hurting the country if you do. H.R. 2283, known as the Stop Online Ammunition Sales Act of 2015, primarily seeks to require face-to-face -face purchases of ammunition, which, of course, if you own a shooting range or you live in the country, would be almost impossible. It says this bill would take the most basic steps to slow the proliferation of guns and ammunition, helping to prevent events like we saw in Aurora, Colorado three years ago, Coleman announced in a press conference, a press release. Congress can and must do more to keep our family safe, and we're arguing for them to do just that. If other people had been armed in the theater, the families would have been safe. The answer is more responsible people owning guns, <clears throat> not less. It says the bill, which has already been co-sponsored by 30 idiot House Democrats who should never get a vote again, that's why they're getting the dumdy of the day, would also require the federal government to issue licenses to ammunition dealers in addition to requiring them to report bulk ammo purchases over 1,000 rounds by unlicensed persons. Well, since when is it the government's job under the Second Amendment to, eliminate, uh, to uh, slow the proliferation of guns and ammunition? I don't believe it is. It says a consumer product that has the potential to kill like a bullet should be regulated in a manner similar to cigarettes and certain allergy medicines. Carol Stiller, president of the Brady Campaign's anti-gun million mile march added, well, if that was the case, then you couldn't be able to buy a spork. Idiots. Now look up um, Bob Costas was right on my site. You will laugh until you cry. It says the proposed legislation has earned the scorn of gun aficionados who view the bill as ineffective and ultimately a roundabout way of infringing on the Second Amendment, both of which is true. It said responding to Re uh, New Jersey Rep. Frank Pallone's remark that someone in possession of 6,000 rounds of ammo boggles the mind, Mark Chestnut, writing for America's First Freedom.org, highlighted that competition shooters typically use 1,000 rounds per day. Yes, competition shooters, of which there are thousands, if not millions, 